Hey everyone, I'm Kerry Smith and um, I'm sitting here with Amar Shaw and Amar and I are both from Client First Capital. And hey, to Amar, today I have maybe just a little bit of curveball. So I didn't tell you the topic before we joined. And, um, and but, but here's the topic for today. Okay. I've come up with what I believe through years of experience are the five most common questions that people have about retirement as they're getting near retirement. And so, and I figured that, you know, you're probably just the right guy <laughs> to, <laughs> to ask these questions to. All right. Um, all right. So, um, so, so take a deep breath, put on your financial planning um, hat. I know you know how to answer all of these questions. And so are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. All right, here we go. <laughs> so the first question I think is probably the most common question. I wouldn't be surprised if you knew it already. But it's the it's the age old question of how much money do I need to retire? Yeah, how much? That is a good question because um, you know everybody wants to know like the nest egg. I think even Fidelity had this uh, commercial where they had the green line that would track through the parts and stuff. And it's just yeah. like your plan takes you to your nest egg um, or, or the dollar amount that you have to retire. Right. Everybody's retirement is different. You know, everybody's lifestyle in retirement uh, is different, right? Uh, people live in different states, different taxes, different uh, distribution streams of, of what they want to do and when they want to do it. And so I would say that is a, a hard one to answer um, in, in a blanket format. But um, I will say it depends on you, right? That, that would be my answer. And a lot of times that I, I can kind of give some generalization of what we see is that the early years of retirement is uh, kind of like imagine your grandchildren before the summer bell is going off, right? The sense of liberation, they're on the edge of their seat. They want to do everything the first two to three weeks of summer, right? And so the first two, three years of retirement is usually a lot of like travel activities, experiences uh, that you know, that they've been waiting to have and do. Um, probably after the third year into uh, the 10th year is, you know, you get some sort of rhythm, uh, a schedule to your day. And, uh, you know, the, you get, get somewhat of a routine, if you will. And then I would say like the, the back half of life or the back third of life, uh, depending on, uh, you know, your genetics, you, you could potentially have some healthcare events and you could possibly have the need for long-term care and and if you don't have those then you probably want to give back to your community through either some charitable work or even gifting to your children grandchildren and stuff like that and so from a cash flow perspective it, it tends to increase as well so it's okay. kind of like a, a you yeah i really like the you know the kind of the school kids summer vacation analogy yeah. because you know i think it is common after a career typically that has a lot of structure and a lot of obligations and you got to be at a certain place at a certain time it's nice just to have the freedom to do what you want to do when you want to do it but as human beings we tend to we, we tend to over time geared back towards some structure and in our life, right, in, in some order. So yeah, I like that analogy. Okay, here's question number two. Yep. Um, how do I create an income stream? So I've saved all this money, I've got pensions, all these different things maybe in my portfolio, but how do I create an income stream that supports the lifestyle that you know I've determined that I can afford? Yeah. And again, that one is so individual as well, right? Like all of these things depends on your situation. Depends how much you have in IRAs, Roth IRAs, taxable accounts. Depends how much pensions you have. Uh, it depends how much uh, you know. Social Security is going to be a part of your overall financial plan, right? I mean, there's there's a lot of variables here. To to give a a, a high level answer to this, Carrie, I think we want to be cognizant of taxes, and we want to do what we can to reduce taxes today and in the future, right? And so some of that looks at all right if the tax bracket is here and we're here in terms of income well maybe we take up a little bit more income this year so that we can offset future years of income right and sometimes it's like looking at investments and saying all right 
does it make sense to take a tax loss or do we take a capital gain this year because in a future year we have uh you know uh some sort of event a sell of a business sell of some real estate where we will have large capital gain where we're going to want to maximize our losses in those years so uh man i i have a feeling that all of these questions are going to be dependent upon your situation but uh hopefully there's some good guidelines here yeah well i think so it's you know for some people it may seem a little odd when you ask about distribution strategies how do i create an income stream and the answer is taxes but but you're you know you're so right and that most people when they retire it's a mix of maybe some pensions maybe some after-tax savings maybe some uh, 401k or IRA savings, maybe some in a Roth. And those complexities make tax strategies even more important when you retire and you create an income stream. Okay, we're moving on to question number three. All right. All right. <laughs> this one, I, I think people have this question a lot. And that is, do I have too much risk in my portfolio? For some people, maybe do I have too little risk in my portfolio? All right. This is a good one. This is a good one. Oftentimes in the accumulation years, we take on as much risk as possible, you know, regardless of how much risk that we're, you know, we're not cognizant of that risk because we're dollar cost averaging in, right? In retirement, you're dollar cost averaging out, right? And so like the exact opposite of uh, dollar cost averaging in. Uh, and, and so oftentimes we find that from the, the client's perspective, their idea is I have X amount of nest egg. How much income can I create off of this nest egg? I don't want to take too much risk because if that nest egg goes down, then I'm not going to be able to create the same amount of income off a smaller nest egg, right? The reality is that we should be focusing on total return. And when you focus on total return and total return equals the income that you get and the equity growth of a portfolio, that, that would equal your uh, total return. When you do that, uh, the opportunity here is that you're, you're going to take on a little bit more risk, but then your money will last longer, right? If you're only focusing on one part of the equation, the income, and you don't take as much risk, then the later years, you're, you're risking uh, a longevity factor now. And, and when we increase the risk, one of the uh, questions I get, well, what if we have a lot of down years? all of a sudden, right? And that is a valid concern, right? And one of the things that we do for our clients is that we have a low risk bucket and we have, you know, the market or whatever the risk bucket is, a variable portfolio. In the, the lower risk bucket, you know, we're going to be pulling from those, those funds in those earlier years where we know what the expenses are and we mm -hmm. replenish that bucket from, you know, our higher risk. So we're, we're building in some gap between when you need the funds and when the funds need to be available. Okay, very good. Um, okay, question number four. So in this one, you know, I think for some people it might actually be question number one. It might be the first thing that they want to know. But I have a four on my list, and it is what are the, what are some of the things, the biggest risk that could derail my retirement plan? Yeah, I mean. In planning, we're planning for the certainty, right, of, of certain things happening. But we also know that there are a lot of uncertainties in life, right? And oftentimes, uh, individuals that do early retirement, sometimes there's a healthcare event, right, or something that's leading to that early retirement. And oftentimes, when we look at risk in planning and the ones that, that are uh, – that, that we can actually kind of calculate around, you know, because there's always some risk that nobody thinks of, right? But uh, in this, we're talking about three factors. One is a, a healthcare event early on, a prolonged healthcare event early on. The second thing is a, probably a premature death. How does that impact the surviving spouse? You know, especially if you're, uh, let's say you're military and you have all this pension income and you may not have SBP or survivor benefit for, for your spouse, how does that impact the overall plan? Um, and, and then third is, you know, on the later years, what if uh, as you get older, you need more help? And what if you have a long-term care event, right? And you need a uh, little bit more than what's average, right? And so when you, ha when you have a need for what's more than average, 
then that definitely can impact the, the other spouse, right? So. Okay. so if I hear you right, if we plan right and think ahead of all the things that could happen, we position ourselves in a way that these things are less likely to derail your retirement plan because you yeah. thought about them and you planned them for them up front. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Okay, so I said there's five questions, but the fifth question, I'm gonna let you off the hook a little bit. Um, there you go. Ask the question, but I'll answer it because I think for my role in the firm, this is probably a better question for me than for you. Sure. And, uh, but you just chime in if you've got anything to add. So that question is, how do I find the right financial advisor? And, um, and that's a good question. You see a lot of it. If, if you search online, you see a lot of different opinions and rules and things to look for. But um, I'm going to boil it. There's, and there's several things that you can consider. Reputation and a whole lot of other things. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to boil it down to three key factors. One is um, you want someone who's a, who's a fiduciary and they're required to act in your best interest, right? They're, they're not acting in the interest of anyone else or any other firms or commissions or kickbacks, things of that nature. They put your needs first. The second is fee structure. So they should have a clearly defined, simple upfront fee structure where you know everything about um, what it costs right up front. And the third thing is it should, they should also have a full range of services investment strategies, tax strategies, retirement planning, estate planning, whatever your needs are financially, you should be able to get all of your financial questions answered by this person, right? Now there's credentials and other things that are important too, but I'll leave it at those three for now. Um, anything to add on that? Yeah, you know, I uh, know that I think that was really good. I think the only thing I would say is experience with working with folks just yeah. like you, right? Um, uh, or in the sense that um, if an advisor was working with NFL players and athletes and stuff like that, they may not be so well versed with like uh, people that are engineers or uh, have a, a Boeing pension or, you know, so the demographic of their current client base should, should kind of represent. Yeah. Another good yourself. point. You know, I'm going to say, so I'm going to just sneak one more in there for me personally. And I know a lot of people who feel this way, is good to work with someone who is is a little bit younger than yourself and the reason is is if it's your golf buddy and um and you're well into retirement they're probably thinking about it too and at the time that you need them most when you're transitioning or your estate um, needs attention they may be transitioning out of the business so if you're working with an advisor who still has a lot of experience but is younger they're there to help you and maybe even importantly more importantly your family with major transitions that might need to happen and so just a just a, that's just a personal feeling of mine i like to um to to, to target advisor who's a little bit younger than i am yeah. okay um all right so i think we've covered this topic pretty well that those are the the five questions we hear the most i got to commend you good job i think you uh I think you did a good job, um, especially not having having um, been prepared beforehand. So, <laughs> yeah. um, hey, let me wrap up. Um, so again, I'm Kerry Smith. This is Marsha with, with Client First Capital. If you have financial questions or want to go deeper on some of these questions, um, just reach out to us. You can reach us at clientfirstcapital.com and uh, you can schedule an appointment. You can give us a call and we have a lot of information on our website as well. Um, with that, I want to thank you. Thanks, Carrie. Hey, Mark. Bye. Bye.